we we saw in figure 8.3 that, that we had two basic units that made up sheets of clay that we saw at a microscopic level. I want to go on to, to talk about isomorphous substitution on page 241 of your text. You'll see that there's a whole section on uh, isomorphous or isomorphic substitution. And um, to be isomorphic means means same changing, same changing. So um, we'll see that we talked about a silicon tetrahedron. So remember this is it right here is our silicon tetrahedron. It has four sides. One, two, three, and then one on the bottom. Okay, four-sided. This is our aluminum octahedron, um, and we mentioned last time that sometimes you can have magnesium in here um, as well. And so, so that change is really what we're talking about from from something inside, from one thing inside here to another thing inside here. And this is really what gives clay a really interesting feature. So let's talk just a second about, um, about that. So, so here's our two um, tetrahedrons and oct our tetrahedron and octahedron. And in both of these um, basic units, you can have a substitution when this clay is being formed. So let me back up just a second and say, when we break down rock material into very, very uh, small, small pieces you can think about uh, into its constituent parts, we can actually have a, uh, a remaking of, uh, of material or minerals. And that's what's happening with, that's what can happen with clay. We can actually have clays created in the soil from, from material and elements that have been broken down. They can reform, and so we can call them secondary, uh, secondary minerals. So that's what clays are, are, are sometimes reformed minerals from those really broken down constituent part constituent parts when we're when we're making these when these layers and sheets of clay are made you can actually have substitution so so normally we have silicon in this uh, in this tetrahedron like we saw on the last slide only now we see that aluminum is inside that uh, tetrahedron when we have when we have this substitution instead of silicon, so silicon doesn't get to go in and make uh, make this tetrahedron. All of a sudden, aluminum substitutes every so often for silicon. Well, aluminum is only three plus. Okay, silicon was four plus. So so when silicon was here, all four of these uh, four of these oxygens were satisfied with a, the oxygens are negatively charged, all four of them were, po were satisfied with these four um, positive charges. Everybody was happy. Now when we put aluminum in there, all of a sudden we have three, uh, three positive charges, but we have four negative charges. Okay, These oxygens are, uh, have a negative charge to them. So all of a sudden that, may, that means that Three of these are, are okay, or we can think about them as being satisfied. Okay, don't need any more charge there. And one of them is not. One of them is, is doesn't doesn't have a positive charge to uh, to match up with it. So all of a sudden, this tetrahedron takes on a negative charge. Okay, now it's not it, it's, it's not insanely negative. It won't you know. Uh, it's not it's not a huge negative charge right but it's negative nonetheless the same thing can happen with our octahedrons we normally have aluminum inside here but sometimes we have magnesium that comes in here instead of aluminum when these sheets are being formed in the soil what that does again we have three charges that are fulfilling the, the needs of these oxygens, okay, a little bit of the needs of these oxygens, and you saw sometimes that we share those as well. But now we only have two. So again, we have this, this net negative uh, charge here that's not being satisfied by whatever is in 
the middle. Now, the whole sheet isn't like this, because if the whole sheet were like this, it wouldn't be able to hold together very well. There's, there's a reason why silicon is in here for tetrahedrons and aluminum is in here for octahedrons. That's how it holds together fairly well. If we don't have that, if we substituted every single aluminum for, uh, magnesium for aluminum and every single uh, aluminum for silicon over here, the, the structure probably wouldn't hold together. The sheet wouldn't hold together because it's not exactly what these structures need in terms of charges. But every now and again, it happens. And that is the basis for the, the, this idea that we can say that clay is negatively charged. Okay, negatively charged. Why? Well, because every once in a while, this happens. This substitution, isomorphic substitution happens. These things, these structures, can remain as they are with a substitution of a different element in there than normal. Okay. So clays end up with a negative charge. You have a sheet. So here's our tetrahedral sheet. And, uh, and you can imagine that sometimes we might have a change in this tetrahedral sheet. So this one right, right, right here might have a negative charge. Maybe this one over here has a slightly negative charge. And so overall, this whole sheet overall will have a little bit of a negative charge. The same thing, the same thing can happen with our octahedral sheet. We can have this one over here have a substitution. Maybe... This one here has a substitution, and so again, our overall charge is negative. Okay, so that is isomorphic substitution, and this is why all this matters to us because all of a sudden, this clay, these sheets of clay, and the little micrograph that we saw of clay, all of a sudden that has a negative charge, and what we know is that. There's positively charged things that are floating around in the soil uh, that we would like to keep around in the soil. And so those positively charged ions can attach to these, uh, to these clay colloids. And that's what makes them so special, more special than silt, more special than sand, is that these can hold positively charged ions in the soil. Let's say potassium. That's a positively charged ion in the soil. And that is actually a plant nutrient that can be attached to the soil and it can come off the soil. Let's say calcium, Ca, and it has two positive charges. That can be attached to the soil. And so the soil, the colloids especially, can act like a reservoir for these nutrients, a reservoir, a, 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 an attractant, a, a bucket, we can put these nutrients on, or you know, like a big Velcro thing, we can put these nutrients on to hold them for later on when a plant might need them. We'll talk more about this and you'll read more about this as you go on uh, in, uh, in this chapter. I'll run through these real quick. We'll probably see another version. There's another version of this in uh, in your book. You'll see. Uh, let me turn. This is on figure 8.7. We'll see this again, but I wanted to show it to you with the forms that we had. Uh, the forms that we had here. This is kaolinite, and you can see in figure 8.7 as well. There's a kaolinite, your very first one. The CEC. So now we have a thing called CEC cation cation exchange capacity. Cation is positively charged ion. Exchange is going on to and coming off of uh, the, the clay particle. And then capacity is just how much is it able to do that. You'll see later on, we're, we're going to have a, a video on the mole, uh, what that is and what that means. Uh, so you need to watch that. <clears throat> right now you can think of this as as a number, and we've seen this in a table before, there's, there's other tables in chapter 8 that show you this. This number is showing us how, how much capacity there is for this particular clay to hold cations on it. Does it have a lot? Does it have a little? Okay. The other thing to see here is that we can call these 
particular kinds of clays, a one-to-one -one clay or a two-to-one clay. This is actually one-to-one. -one. It has one tetrahedral and one octahedral sheet. That makes up a, a sheet. We also have another one here, one tetrahedral, one octahedral sheet here. And uh, these, are, these are attached together. <clears throat> you can see here. And they're pretty tightly attached together. Okay. But a single sheet is made up of one tetrahedral, one octahedral. We'll see in just a second uh, one that's made up of two tetrahedrals to one octahedral. Here's montmorillonite. Montmorillonite is what we call an expanding clay. So you saw that uh, uh, picture from the montmorillonite in Wyoming. And uh, we mine this as bentonite is what it's called uh, commonly here. So this one is a two to one clay. So we have two tetrahedrals, two of those, and one octahedral. Okay, so two to one clay. It's expanding, so we can fit this. We can fit a bunch of water here uh, in the middle, and that makes it uh, swell. Or if we don't have a lot of water, it dries out. It will shrink. So compare what we had um, in the last, uh, in the last uh, for for kaolinite, we had ten centimoles of charge, ten uh, centimoles of space to hold positively charged ions. Here we have one hundred. That's a lot. Montmorillonite is the the clay with the most capacity to hold charge. You'll see this in Figure eight point seven if you're looking at that if you have your book open uh, as well. This is this is also called smec type. That's the other name for it. So we're looking at the same sort of thing here. Smectite is the second one uh, on figure 8.7. Okay, so that's Montmorillonite. Expanding clay, 2 to 1 clay, high CEC. Here we have illite. And in figure 8.7, you'll see this as what they call fine-grained mica, non-expanding. The uh, fourth one over from the left-hand side. Again, we have a two to one clay, and you can see, okay, there's a tetrahedral, there's an octahedral, there's a tetrahedral. So two tetrahedrals, one octahedral, two to one sheets, okay? So uh, that's illite. We have this, this what we call interlayer potassium that's kind of binding these two sheets together. And incidentally, when this starts to break down, so let's say we're weathering this illite, you'll have a release of potassium, uh, and, and that's, that's good for plant growth because potassium is a, a nutrient for, uh, for plant growth. This doesn't expand. There's no room for wa water can't get inside these, this inner layer spaces, uh, so it doesn't expand. has a medium, uh, according to the other two that we've seen, a medium uh, CEC, 40 centimoles of charge per kilogram. 40, uh, uh, you can think of it as... 40 times x, uh, 40 times a really big number, uh, places to hold positive charges uh, on its surfaces. Okay, so it can hold it. Um, if this is a top surface, it can hold charges here. We can hold them on the side. But remember, the whole, uh, the whole of this, um, this clay is negatively charged. Okay, so that means we have a capacity to hold positive things on the surfaces, but we also have the capacity to repel negative things. So if this thing is negatively charged, if I come through here with a negatively charged ion, what we call an anion, then it's going to be repelled. It doesn't want to get anywhere close to that surface because it is negatively charged and the surface of the clay, or the, the clay itself, is negatively charged.